Good afternoon. I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is like the normal Thursday lecture period. So we have an hour and a half, is that right? The students, the rest of you, whatever. You can tell whatever you want to. Do we have an hour and a half? Yes, no? Yes. Good. Because I think I'll probably talk for 35 or 40 minutes. And then we'll have 35 or 40 minutes to answer questions. Because if I've done my job, some of you will be angry. Some of you will be challenged. Some of you will think differently. Because every time I talk on the subject that I'm talking on today, which isn't too often because it's relatively new thinking for me, uh, I make myself kind of angry. So um, it's okay. What was commemorated last Friday? Veterans Day. Do you have any veterans in the group? Thank you. start with a clip to see if we can get the technology to work. Coorstec is an advanced technical ceramics manufacturer. I'm not going to really talk about Coorstec unless you have questions about it afterwards. But I play the following clip for a specific reason, and that is um, our veterans sometimes get a bum rap, <clears throat> and I think that's unfair. And uh, so this is my tribute to the bravery of our soldiers. Um, to set this up, it's a 10 second video clip, so you have to pay attention. It was filmed in Baghdad, Iraq. Taken, the video was done by uh, a sniper team. One guy was a shooter, one guy was a shooter. One was, the gun, one was with a gun, one was with a camera. And I'll tell you the rest of the story here in a sec, if this works. Did it work? Sí. 
imagine what it would be like to have to live your life without any light. These communities have no access to electricity. So in a community that has no lighting, think about the children. It's dark and they can't study. They are at a huge disadvantage. In Kenya, the normal way people cook is with wood. Where's all this wood coming from? The forests are being chopped down and deforestation is happening. The burden of the woman is extremely heavy. These women are suffering. When they are coming from the forest, they try so much to carry a hip, which will really make her tired. It takes them hours to prepare a meal. It's something that we would do in 15 minutes. The smoke in the houses are living and breathing, the smoke. Most of our people have been having effect in damages the lungs. They have toddlers that are walking around these open flames. There's a child down here who was burnt. I was living in the first rooftop. Yes, we turned the house we used to live in, it was just a curtain. So it is the, the firewood that took out the curtain, so eventually the whole house burned down. It has been just difficult for her with the peer group because they laugh at her that she's like a little she has a different time. So we are very much afraid with the fire. Charity. I got some hands up then, that's good. 
How many of you believe poverty can be and needs to be eliminated? Good. So back to the, my story. In the 1990s, there weren't any right answers there, by the way. This was just a way of getting hands up so I can learn a little bit about who's in the audience. Some, sometimes on the, on the, I get different responses, um, which is cool. In the 1990s, I ran the largest solar electric integration and distribution business in America. I'd say it was like the cylinder of the day. <laughs> we never had a bad time. As uh, part of our business plan and in conjunction with the Department of Energy, this is like deja vu all over again, uh, we developed a solar system to provide electricity to poor communities in South America and in Africa. I even had the opportunity to fly to South Africa on a mission, this is not a Christian mission, a government mission with the then Secretary of Energy, Hazel O'Leary. <clears throat> How many of you ever heard of Hazel O'Leary? I am shocked everybody's heard of Hazel O'Leary. Um, after bringing electricity to numerous communities, uh, that effort failed for a number of reasons, not the least of which was government interference. Wherever we went with our systems, the government-owned utility promised to bring grid electricity for cheaper. They never did, but it's really hard to compete with promises of better service for cheaper. And to be clear, solar is more expensive and provides uh, less of a service, lower level of service than the grid. And solar electricity's problems begin with a 25% capacity factor. It only works in the sunshine. <clears throat> Which for those of us in the West is more often than for those of us who are in other places in the world. When we sold that business in 1999, one of the potential buyers was a very large non-American oil company. In describing our business, I discussed with them the experiences that we had with government interference. Their answer was simple, straightforward, and disconcerting. We know what to do in that situation. We buy the government. And that's a direct quote. Does that make you uncomfortable? While we were selling the business, I left um, the solar electric field to go to work at Coors Tech, which is where I'm still today. However, in 2001, I felt God's call in my life to return to work the issue of energy poverty in Africa. So while serving as chairman and CEO of Coors Tech, which was a public company at the time, a friend and I started a completely unrelated public non profit charity named Community Uplift Ministries, which ran a program named Circle of Light. So if you Google me, you'll see Circle of Light. Designed to be, do you guys Google? Or is that, is that passe, is it now on Facebook? I don't know. <laughs> so Circle of Light was designed to meet the uh, modern energy needs of rural Africa, in particular for cooking, lighting, and communications. The fuel source was LP gas, or what we would call propane. We launched our first Kenyan community in 2003 with much fanfare. The vice president of the country, that's kind of cool, um, even came as our chief guest for the ceremony. The community that we were in had never seen a light bulb before our arrival. Think about that. Lives were truly transformed that day in many ways, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So let me show you the rest of the video here. Um, the video is, is reflects a ministry that is distinctively Christian, which won't be offensive to you, some audience as it is. And just as an aside before I push the button, uh, radical Islamists are targeting Kenya is about an 80% Christian country. But they just passed a new constitution which enshrines Sharia law. I don't know if you know how, 
how uh, dangerous that is, but we can talk about that too. <coughs> energy for the people living in the rural areas of developing countries. There are two pieces. One piece is lighting, the other piece is cooking. The energy source is propane. This gas has been a bus. The movie moon. It's essentially a recorder, a tube, or a cook stove. The lighting, we use 12 volt lighting in the home. It's very nice. And the, the wedding will be lighting. The cooking stove will serve me a lot of time when I go to fetch firewood from the forest. Which will take me from morning to around four. So this one is just switching on and there is fire. I think about health and the children and the impact that that will have on the kids long term. I think I now is if it becomes free of smoke. Or she doesn't have to worry about her kids falling into the fires. It has really changed my life. The opportunities for the children now who will be able to compete. The youth during the night to study their books. Children enjoying reading. It has helped my children during the night breaks. At least they can do their breaks. And I can see the performance has improved. The people that live in town and us, we are the same. You can't walk past the needs of people and ignore it. A large part of discipleship is actually meeting people's needs. The people make an instinctive connection to God. What I want about our job now, because of uh, this project, it is also serve as an encouragement to the non-believers. Even in the night, do you think that if you like that I would have the end houses? But the night at night with me is the light of Jesus. The first day after we handed out the lighting of the kids in Matumbe, that was on Saturday. And then when they on a Sunday, I would show when the chief called me, Nathan, can you give us a bit today? He said, today, 30 people gave their lives to Christ. Because they said, we now know he cares.
Today, every person we had been serving is back in the dark ages. The program is finished, and we are attempting through legal action to recover more than a million dollars of assets that were taken. I'm not optimistic, but we'll see. We've been at it now for three years. Another quick comment, partner as used in Africa often means you bring the money and we will spend it. Never do work with nonprofits registered as such in Kenya and maybe other African countries because Nonprofit law is different than for-profit law there. Showing that video is quite painful for me because a lot of the voices you hear, uh, besides mine of course, um, are crooks. Finally, beginning late last year, we began again. This time as a for-profit enterprise in Kenya. And you know how they define insanity. It took us from November to May to incorporate, and from May to August to open a bank account. Do you all know how hard that is in America? With a one-day activity. <laughs> Access Energy now has about, we changed the name from Circle of Light to Access Energy. Sounds more business-like, don't you think? We now have about 500 paying customers, and we'll see how it develops. The need is the same, only growing. There are more than 30 million people in Kenya. Kenya is the size of Texas. There are 30 million people in Kenya cooking with wood and lighting their homes with kerosene lamps. So the solution that we offer still works. So what lessons have I learned? <clears throat> First of all, the problems of Africa and poverty are not easily solved. If it were easy, all the problems would have been solved by now. Did you know that more than a trillion dollars of official aid, that means government to government aid, and a like amount of unofficial aid, which is donors, have been poured into Africa from the West and the people of Africa are no better off, and some would argue that they are worse off. Being well-intentioned is not sufficient. As the saying goes, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Second, the approaches I've tried so far have been wrong. Solar is too limited, you can't cook with it. It's too expensive, and most importantly, it has no ongoing revenue stream to support a service infrastructure. Aid or charity, broadly applied, is detrimental. And this is where I'm hoping to make somebody uncomfortable. Why is that? <clears throat> it has this uncanny outcome of creating dependency and disempowering the recipients, while at the same time making donors feel good about themselves. Guilt-driven giving or self-centered giving is always wrong. Aid also encourages corruption and alleviates basic accountability. There are some very interesting books that have been published recently, including Dead Aid, when Helping Hurts, and one about to be released called Toxic Charity. How's that for a provocative title? If you are in the nonprofit world or thinking about it, I recommend you read those. They describe the symptoms pretty well. I don't necessarily agree with their prescriptions. I've come to the conclusion that poverty is not something to be solved. Because it's a symptom. The cause of poverty is oppression and lack of freedom. Oppression can come in many forms, from government policy and practice, 
from non-competitive business practices, from external efforts to control or manipulate, i.e. colonialism. From individual belief systems, I could talk for a long time about the impact of each of these oppressive factors in Africa. Let me give you a simple example of the latter. Our circle of light activities in Mozambique were hindered because of the belief that the LP cylinders were actually bombs we were placing in people's homes to kill them. That's a pretty interesting belief system. It's hard to overcome that. But it's not so irrational for people who've suffered through 30 years of brutal communist dictatorship and civil war, many maimed by bombs. The more complicated example is what we're seeing now in northern Kenya with people starving. You hear that on the news. These people are suffering within 100 miles of the most beautiful agricultural land in the world. I don't know what your view is, your picture of Kenya. It's Beautiful. That land is still being cultivated by plow and oxen. Tomatoes are rotting on the vine, a half hour plane ride from starvation. That's unacceptable. The use of aid or charity in economic or community development is destined to fail. The nonprofit world is basically a socialist economic model. That should get some other people riled up a little bit. It transfers from those who have to those who do not, without any value being created by the recipient. This is completely appropriate in certain defined circumstances. I'm not throwing all aid and charity under the bus, right? Disaster relief, orphan care, those are absolutely appropriate uses of aid. But it cannot serve as a foundation for economic growth. Capitalism and free market competition really do work to improve people's standards of living. Africa, for the most part, has not had that opportunity. Colonialism, which began in the 1850s, was replaced by corrupt um, crony capitalism, I guess, um, and mostly socialism in the 1960s. And the people suffer. And the people of Africa have also learned to be dependent. And they wait for help from their government or from the West. As I mentioned earlier, we have relaunched our energy business in Kenya this year. This time as a for-profit business. What have we seen? It's taken us almost a year to incorporate instead of a bank account. We experience opposition from elements of the government and the multinational oil company cartel. We have learned the impact of donations on the way people think. We initially thought that we should subsidize the in-home systems like we had when we were a nonprofit. We discovered that three quarters of those systems, this is something we never discovered when we were a nonprofit. As a for-profit, we discovered in a month that three-quarters of those systems were never used. Kenyans know a good deal, so they bought. So those systems were then either used as living room furniture. You know, I was in Indonesia, this is as an aside, I was in Indonesia once, and I noticed that people had refrigerators in their living rooms. They had no electricity. I thought that was odd. Or the systems were resold, which is mostly what happened. Um, and aid has a ton of unintended consequences. The Kenyan textile industry has put, been put out of business by donated clothes. It's hard to compete with free. I've heard you've heard some of those stories here on campus. Not many people have. The Kenyan government has taken over the distribution of donated clothes. So when you think about Tom's shoes, think about how the local shoemaker feels, not about how you feel. I 
experienced that firsthand in Ethiopia. Taxing the rich is the new cry in America. Tax millionaires and billionaires. Or you want over $200,000 or whatever number you want to use. And like I said this morning, the 2011 poverty level in the U.S. for a family of four is defined as $22,350. The average Kenyan family earns $800 per year. To a Kenyan, the poor in America look like the millionaires and millionaires. Bono has famously proposed a wealth tax on the West of 1%. Why stop at 1%? Why not 10%? or 20% or 30% of the income for every American for Africa. Would that solve the problem? No, because the money's not the issue. It would have been solved by now. A couple of trillion dollars is a lot of money in my, in my mind. This was a hard one for me to actually say, but I've actually experienced it once again firsthand. There is a vested interest in keeping poor people poor. That's wicked. But the UN large NGOs and their workers enjoy a great lifestyle on other people's generosity. And they don't want to give that up. But will they do if there are no more poor? A billion dollars per year of food aid is given by USAID in Ethiopia, not just Africa, in one country. Ethiopians are starving. Giving other people's money away leads to corruption. It gives great power to the giver. They get to pick winners and losers while having no accountability. The bottom line is we have been suckered into believing the following. Business is bad. Nonprofit is good. Business is bad. Nonprofit is good. And in Christian circles like I run in mostly, maybe you run in, it's a little more subtle. It's business is bad. Nonprofit is good. But the church or the ministry can launder your filthy lucre and make it clean. When was the last time you saw a movie where the business guy was anything but a bad guy? I'm not sure I've ever seen a movie where a business guy was a good guy. Nowhere in history has socialism created economic development and improved the standards of living. Nowhere. This is one I just happened upon that I thought was quite fascinating. You guys ever thought about it? It's Thanksgiving next week, right? What are we celebrating Thanksgiving? The pilgrims coming, right? And the first Thanksgiving with the Wamaponok Indians, or whatever. However you pronounce that tribe. They were, who were the pilgrims? The pilgrims were a bunch of religious refugees, impoverished, living in Holland. They were kicked out of their country. They were living in a foreign country. So how did that group pay for their trip on the Mayflower? Ever wonder about that? That's a really weird question to wonder about. I'm kind of a weird guy. How did they get to America? Nobody knows that answer. What kind of history are you teaching here? <laughs> Where's the history department? <laughs> Anybody a history major? My daughter wants to be a history major. They were funded by venture capitalists out of England. Their trip was paid for by venture capitalists. How's that for bizarre? They had a seven year deal. Return the capital in seven years and we'll split the profit. Might work somewhere else. You know, Steve Jobs didn't give the iPhone away. As a matter of fact, they're really expensive. Right? 
iPhone, iPad, I'm guilty. Henry Ford didn't give away the car. Alexander Graham Bell didn't give away the telephone. Standards of living don't increase without profit. Anywhere, never. And I mentioned this book this morning, and I'd love to have you guys get it on campus, read it, read it, think about it. I wrote this short book called Business for the Glory of God. And it's the theological foundation. It's the biblical basis for business. Why is business good? And the answer is, God designed it that way. And his conclusion after doing the theological study, and he's a theologian, he works at a university, is that I believe the only long-term solution to poverty is business. That's a very powerful statement. And I believe the church today, and my guess is most of you like me, have bought into that mistaken belief that more aid is with Africa and other poor countries than people really need. We missed the mark. I talked this morning about Luke 19, the parable of the Venus, or the parable of $20,000, three months wages, whatever. I'll never again give God's assets to a non-profit entity engaged in economic development work. That's the conclusion I've reached. That's a strong statement. It's like the servant who said, at least I didn't lose the money, and look, I got a 40% tax deduction. I don't think that's what Jesus is challenging us to do. I think he's challenging us to take what we have and make something more out of it. Nonprofits, as I said before, are really just the creation of the tax code. And I need to do this research. I don't know what people did before 1915 or whenever the 501c3 segment of the tax code was written. But that's what a nonprofit is. It's a tax code creation. And that's the wrong foundation for economic development. I was on a trip a month ago to visit our children's home. So children's homes, that's fine with me. We don't want to make money off the kids. China's pretty good at making money off the kids. Uh, Bulgaria, one of our adopted kids is from Bulgaria. And it cost us, I think, I think the, the bribe started at 10,000 and we got an end of 5,000 to the orphanage director. Um, but before uh, she was, it took us a year to get the child. And um, it was because the orphanage director was selling her kids, her orphans, uh, to India for child prostitution. That's pretty disgusting. I hope I never meet that lady. I mean, that'd be nice. So, we don't make money on orphans, right? We agree there? <laughs> and we don't make money on people who are suffering and need relief. We good there. But people should not be in relief long term. We want them to, their standard of living to improve. It has to be a capitalist foundation. So I was in Kenya. We brought along a medical dental team to treat people in the neighboring community. We were out in the middle of nowhere. It's a, it's a very rural setting. So the team in three days saw 1,500 people. Can you imagine that? We turned away thousands of them, lined up at the gates trying to get in to get a tooth pulled or a filling or an abscess drained or just simple stuff. I don't like getting these old. And my heart broke as we pushed the people away from the compound. It was terrible. Because I knew that we wouldn't be coming back for a long time, if ever. And those people will never get treatment. Maybe people with abscess teeth, pain, and agony that we couldn't treat. 
and I was really angry, made me mad. But the answer isn't to bring over a, a medical team once a month, or once every week, or once every two weeks. That doesn't solve it, right? You can't do that. We don't have enough medical people who don't have jobs over here <laughs> needing to go over there to do volunteer work. It doesn't work. The answer is those people need jobs. They need to be able to afford their own medical care. So what creates jobs? Does government create jobs? I think America thinks that now. Government doesn't create jobs. Does a nonprofit create jobs? No. What creates jobs is business. And what creates businesses? Entrepreneurs and investors, just like the pilgrims. Investment is the single most powerful expression that we can give in another person's dignity. If I say I am willing to entrust my assets in you, in your idea, in your dream, exchange for getting a return on that investment, that is an incredibly honoring statement. Very different than the statement of a donor who says, I'm here to save you and you're poor. And by me giving you money, I enshrine you in your poverty. So let me talk a little bit about global warming is, is illustrative of, of another problem that I'm nervous about. Um, in order to abstain, obtain the same standard of living in Africa that we have in the U.S., Africa needs the same energy infrastructure, which is carbon-based. There is no other energy infrastructure out there, and without energy, as I said before, you can't do any kind of economic development. Oil and gas are being discovered and produced in Africa but mostly for export. So I didn't see too many hands go up on the global warming thing here. So you all are weird. You're supposed to be students and young and ideological and all that sort of stuff. Although my son tells me that, that this generation is buying into the global warming thing quite the same way as mine did. Uh, my views began being shaped when I was a student, just like you guys, in the 1970s, which there were no dinosaurs in 1970. <laughs> there were some bones. But. Back then, the purveyors of doom predicted a man-caused ice age was in it. There's some people who are my age. you remember that? Do you remember the ice age was coming? We were, the, the carbon was going to create the ice age. <clears throat> And that we'd be out of oil by the year 2000. You know, in the Old Testament, when people made prophecies like that, they went wrong, what happened to them? They don't do that. They could still be experts. So in the 1990s, when I was uh, part of the solar industry, I was invited to the White House to participate in a small conference on renewable energy, hosted by President and Mrs. Clinton and Vice President Al Gore. Pretty amazing. They were, all three were in attendance for the entire day. It's a pretty incredible thing. Two things impressed me. First was the chart used by Vice President Gore to show global temperatures and atmospheric CO2. That chart that he presented clearly showed that CO2 increases, lagged, temperature rises. I'm an engineer. So I concluded that CO2 increases were caused by temperature rises, not the other way around, which might be the wrong conclusion. And they fixed that chart since then, they don't show it that way anymore. The second thing I remember, how many of y'all come from oil and gas families? A few? Good for you. I love oil and gas. Uh, Vice President Gore told the attendees that oil company executives were like tobacco company executives. That is, they were intentionally trying to kill people for profit. That offended me. <laughs> I really offended me. 
So what I worry about is using Africa as a renewable energy playground for the West to help us salve our collective guilty consciences. And that might sound strange, but let me tell you about uh, a generation ago what happened. In 1962, a book was written named Silent Spring, which was required reading for my generation. Do you guys read Silent Spring anymore? Heard of it? <clears throat> Rachel Carson. There arose a belief that the insecticide DDT was destroying the planet, and its use was banned or radically curtailed. Now, DDT was used to kill mosquitoes and the diseases they carry, like malaria, or West Nile virus, or whatever. Malaria in the U.S. and Europe was eradicated using DDT. We don't see malaria here. But the reduction of the use of DDT has led directly to the deaths, deaths of tens of millions of people in Africa. More than a million people a year die from malaria in Africa. It's the number one killer. And we give them nets. And those that die are mostly the poor and the forgotten. So if you go sit with women who spent their entire lives gathering firewood to cook their meals in smoke-filled houses, beaten by their husbands for being late with the meal, if you hear their broken hearts as they tell their children lost to malaria, burned in the cooking fires, we must be careful not to let our beliefs <coughs> condemn these people to suffering and death. So in conclusion, business done well is of enormous good to society. We must fight against the business is bad, nonprofit is good mentality. Socialism in the guise of charity for a generation has caused enormous damage in those communities it has promised to help. The only answer I know to develop economies is private property enabling capitalism within a framework of free market competition done within an environment of strong legal and personal protections. That's what America has learned. If you want to help in Africa, if you want to help in Africa, replace your donor dollars with investment dollars. Now that may seem strange for college students. How many of you all do short-term missions? Most of you, I have my daughter, my kids do short term missions when they can. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful way to learn about other people, learn about other cultures, develop empathy, learn language skills, do all those things. It's wonderful. But it's not missions. <laughs> Sorry. It's cultural exchange, which is cool. But maybe we could think about, instead of doing short-term missions, actually taking that money. It's a lot of money. It's thousands of dollars, right? To go to overseas. Maybe we could instead invest in a business or two. Let local businesses create jobs, opportunities for people, make their lives better for a long time and not for a short time. Because what Africans need are jobs. Jobs are created by business, not by charity. And business is created by investment. And let's not, please let's not, as the West, uh, impose our views on what's good and bad type of energy and condemn the continent to poverty, which is what that would be. So thank you. That's the end of my blathering. And I would love to answer questions until they make me sit down. <laughs>